Yes, so uh, here we are. Uh, <clears throat> I started working in the Flissr archive uh, in 2008. Uh, my first job was to digitize the video uh, collection. And uh, then I discovered that, uh, well, uh, during the uh, 2000s, through no real mistake um, or no real uh, ill uh, will, uh, a lot of the archive, especially the audio archive, was um, transferred to CD-ROM, uh, which had become uh, unusable. Uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of material which actually uh, was on the on the verge of being um, uh, just uh, unaccessible. Uh, perpetually lost um, because the originals had been uh, destroyed when uh, uh, media was transferred to CD-ROM. Uh, it was a big warning to to us actually at that time, and uh, of course, uh, we if you if you go back, I think it's mostly well known to most of you who work in uh, digital archives uh, that you know videotape is still pretty robust. You can still cut it and splice it, and then uh, you know audio tape is pretty good. Records, old uh, vinyl records are. Are quite good. Uh, you can even like cracked records. You can stick together, and um, and books, of course, are the best. When I was doing my doctorate, I uh, I was was pretty amazed that you could go to the library and just get a 300-year-old book and uh, just read it in in normal sunlight. Um, Willem uh, Flusser is a, is a very interesting case in point. I don't know if um, uh, here here we're talking not just about uh, doc, uh, preserving or making uh, accessible. Uh, of finished work, but actually a kind of a philosophical process. Uh, uh, Willem Flusser uh, had a particular, a particular biography, kind of somehow um, uh, typical for the, uh, the period. He was born in 1920 uh, in Prague. He, uh, he had to leave uh, when the Nazis moved uh, into Prague in 1939. I uh, lost his uh, his family. Uh, he got uh, kind of um, rescued by his uh, future wife, and brought to Brazil, where he lived for 30 years, and developed his philosophical practice in a in a in a kind of feral way. I mean, because he was he was forced to uh, stop his formal education, but he started his formal education in the classic Central European manner. So um, uh, the classics, uh, Greek. Uh, and uh, Roman scholars, and then up to through the the Enlightenment uh, philosoph philosophical tradition, um, <clears throat> he became a a, a philosopher of um, of writing and of uh, communication philology, and uh, he uh, was at the end of his uh, uh, well, he he died in a in a car accident uh, suddenly, but uh, by the time he was. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Getting on uh, 70 years old or so, he was uh, one of the well, most well-known uh, thinkers on uh, digital um, or s electronic um, media in Europe, and he was touring around like Ars Electronica and all the big festivals. Uh, he <clears throat> I'm, we're going to show a couple of uh, projects here uh, where he where he was um, yeah exp exploring his uh, his philosophical practice actively engaging with the technology for him the uh, the uh, new tech the new technologies were themselves actually inscribed with writing they <clears throat> did not represent a departure from writing um, although they <clears throat> they used a, a different principle they actually manifested um, text through images of course like the every every um, the letter on a on a computer screen is an image. It's not a text. But inside those uh, images, uh, there is the history of uh, human thinking, which is enacted in the computer processing, which thereby produces this illusion of writing in images. So therefore, underneath it all, there's there's still writing. And <clears throat> Flusser always like in, encourages us to uh, uh, acknowledge a kind of a tension between images and writing. So what you have is that like there's the magicians. Very briefly, the magicians had the the image world, and they were controlling everybody with their images. Then the priests came with their writing to dis to fight the images, and uh, then there's like this conflict between images and writing for for uh, a while. Writing eventually wins, and this is this is um, uh, a little quote that kind of puts it together. Uh, text finally succeeded after 3,000 years to bring about the Enlightenment, to force the images into museums or into the unconscious. The contemporary struggle between text and images will not last so long, though. 
digital thinking will prevail more quickly. And uh, what we have is that <clears throat> there's a, um, the images are coming back, and we're, we're communicating more in images, and that's, uh, I think you, uh, you probably all uh, acknowledge that. However, um, inside those images, <clears throat> there are oppressed texts, and uh, we have to kind of uh, uh, engage with these oppressed te texts and see that these, these texts are still uh, actually, for Flusser, being from the Enlightenment tradition, those texts are the key to our autonomy in a world uh, dominated by, text, um, by technical images. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this essay, Hat uh, Schreiben Zukunft, uh, does uh, writing have a future was published as probably the first um, German language electronic philosophy book on two floppy disks. Would you agree, Philip? I don't know. We don't know for sure, but uh, it might have been. Here, uh, it was two floppy disks, which uh, we have uh, <clears throat> managed to get uh, working again. Um, it's not a uh, it's, this is a, a first try. It's 1987. Uh, he was uh, approached by Andreas Müller-Pola, who is his main German publisher, uh, to do this experiment. And in this experiment, he definitely is not using the computer media or the floppy disk as a storage for his thought, but he's using the, uh, this opportunity to engage the reader in a kind of a dialogue. And this is always important in Flusser, that, so that the, the philosoph phil philosophy takes place in a dialogue and not in a, just a providing what he calls discourse, in a providing uh, just a one-way uh, uh, communication. So the, even though uh, it, it is uh, his philosophy stored on the floppy disk, the way that, and, and uh, Philip will show you a little bit about it uh, in a few minutes, um, the, the way that the whole project is conceived is that it's, it's interactive from the, first, in, from the beginning and that you're supposed to engage and you can even uh, change texts. And from, uh, from early on, Flusser has a very uh, uh, good sense of what is possible to do, and um, this is kind of embodied in this small, this small quote from a, a, a letter uh, to one of his correspondents, Abraham Moles. Flusser also like, did not philosophize alone. He always uh, philosophized in uh, correspondence with other friends and through uh, mail uh, post. Um, yeah, so uh, Abraham Mola, do you ever think of philosophizing with the technology instead of merely on the technology? That means you, you use the potential of the new technology to generate new forms of philosophy instead of just using the technology to store the philosophy. Um, this kind of thinking of uh, uh, using technology to philosophize was uh, not new for Flusser at that time. So 14 years earlier in 74, he worked with um, uh, a, a video artist called uh, Fred Forrest, who we also, uh, we, we actually... Um, Redigitized his uh, 1974 uh, Porta Pack videos uh, to produce this installation. But uh, in this installation, Flusser is, uh, in this video, Flusser is actually talking through the camera to us now. So 40 years later, he's saying, You, at the other side of this, you know, this screen, you must now communicate with us here in 1974 to uh, generate a new discourse. And Fred will take you and bring you back into the video. He had a pretty complicated uh, story of how that was supposed to happen, but uh, anyway, the, the intention was already there uh, uh, 13 years earlier uh, using video. So this plasticity of the medium, the medium as a, a part of a philosophizing process was, was germane to uh, Fl Flusser's practice um, of philosophizing, uh, and he, whatever the new medias and the new electronic uh, 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 functionalities uh, pr uh, produced were inspiring for him, and he grasped them. Uh, right, so uh, this is the main and the most uh, difficult project that we had to uh, uh, work on for the, uh, the exhibition, and, and uh, um, Philip will talk um, more uh, in detail about the technical part. Uh, it, uh, it's called the Flusser experiment, part, part of an experiment at the uh, uh, Nuclear uh, Research Institute in Karlsruhe, the, what's called the Kernforschungsinstitut, um, which is now the KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, but uh, it was a nuclear research institute where they were uh, developing the hypertext uh, uh, standard 
Web Hypertext Standard, which what became Web Hypertext Standard. And actually, uh, these these experiments here uh, influenced uh, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, assistant, uh, Roger Kalou. Um, so they they had pretty far-reaching uh, uh, implications. Uh, one of the uh, experiments, one kind of uh, use case, was to work with Flusser and uh, this this guy Bernd Wingert, who is a, a sociologist and uh, not a, a technologist directly, but uh, he was the leader of this project, and he had to ex explain why he had to work with this crazy professor. Um, and there's some really really interesting uh, documents about that, but they are of course not born digital at all. Um, here is uh, the early uh, design for the the um, project. What well, what it would start with was a um, uh, a lecture by Flusser, but then it would uh, be uh, the idea was to give everybody the impression of being in the room with Flusser. So sound was very important, and also you would be able to navigate through layers of meaning, potential meaning. So you have like uh, here it says. Kurze Erläuterung, lange Erläuterung, layers uh, of, uh, these are short um, elaborations, longer elaborations, and then Quellen is uh, um, sources, resources. Usually uh, Flusser never mentioned his, his sources. Uh, I just put this text, I'll go back to this text for a second, but uh, uh, Wingert um, says in this, here that we chose uh, Flusser because he really does grasp what is possible, even though he's, he says here he's a little bit naive about how optimistic uh, the, the possibilities are. He's also very critical uh, of how um, technical images and uh, technical um, uh, information can be used. So it uh, eventually uh, took this form. It was uh, created in HyperCard, and we'll see a lot about that in Philip's uh, presentation, so I won't talk too much about that there. Um, you can see uh, the early HyperCard uh, uh, manifestation with these little squares there, which, uh, uh, which were hyperlinks. I was showing you two new parts of the um, uh, database. And there you can see that there's a, a Kurzerläuterung, so you have the layers, uh, the, the um, the navigation pa pane on the side and um, how the uh, media was structured. Yes. So here's a uh, another quote, just uh, again talking about the the how, uh, to show you how how he's uh, grappling with this this uh, tension between images and uh, text. It's been a while since the alphabetical code was adequate to render the kinds of information. At, uh, available today. He was talking about like uh, uh, particle physics and things like we can't really describe them in words. We need these technical images to philosophize about the, uh, the, the kind of information that we're confronted with today. This leads to numerical codes coming into their own, for example, digital codes, and on the other hand, to new image codes photos, videos, synthetic images, and holograms. Criticism and creativity will possibly have to be encoded into these codes into the f in the future. So his idea was that we can create autonomy in a world that's kind of dominated by technical images, uh, by where we're getting all of our information by from technical Im images by encoding into the code that produces the technical images um, new potentialities. Um, <clears throat> the uh, hypertext was donated to the uh, Willem Flusser archive in 1987 by Bernd Fingert uh, as he was, he was retiring. And uh, he gave us a, a, a Performa 630 uh, on which it kind of ran, uh, but uh, not reliably. Uh, we wanted to show it at the uh, 20th anniversary of Flusser's death uh, in 2011. Uh, at the Transmediale, so we actually tried to make a robust enough system to uh, play it back or to allow people to experience this interaction with Flusser at the Transmediale, uh, and uh, we uh, bought a bunch of uh, computers uh, on eBay and uh, chopped them up and tried to um, make something that worked. Uh, both of them uh, died during the the three days of the Transmediale. So, and uh, one of them died after the first day. So it was really a um, very, very difficult uh, thing to, uh, to accomplish to get something that was actually working on a, on a period computer. For uh, the exhibition at ZKM, we went a different route. And uh, we actually uh, managed with the great help from the uh, BVFLA, the uh, Baden-Württembergische Baden 
functional long-term archi archiving project, which uh, I think uh, one member is here from somewhere. Um, amazing group, but uh, here we are, we are using an emulation and uh, it's very, uh, it stood up uh, for almost three months uh, in the installation, fan fantastically, and um, Philip will tell you more about that one. So, right now. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone also for coming and for inviting, uh, inviting us. So what I wanna do is I wanna uh, talk about the process of bringing these two uh, digital works that uh, uh, dealt with or really show or enact philosophy uh, into this exhibition. So I was uh, really happy to uh, that people trusted me and uh, let me do this, let me take care of this, and I want to go through how we did it. Um, like the first, um, the, the first thoughts that we we were uh, discussing was, in principle, how should we do it? We've heard about the Transmediale project and that this was uh, really uh, disastrous because the machines just didn't uh, make it to the end. So it was clear for us that we did not want to show these digital artifacts like in a fetishizing their original originality or something, but the, the thing that was the, at the core of what we wanted to show was the concept of those prog programs, like the, the, the concept of Flusser's philosophy and how that went into the coding and how people interact with those programs. Uh, but still, we wanted to keep some, some links to the time frame when all that happened for each of those um, projects back then, because we thought that in order to, like if you go into an exhibition today and you, you see these things, you, you have like this really, the, the, the view from, from now to, to the past and you, you might need these little hints that come through the use of original hardware that you see and then you immediately uh, recall how was that when I saw these things when I was young? Like we are in the fortunate situation that we all have worked and seen these things. Um, to, to bring up all the co things that were connected with it, all the notions of possibilities and how different they were back then than they are now. So uh, we wanted to have old hardware, but also we, want, we did not want to reproduce the, uh, the difficulties um, that you get into when you're running actual old systems. So I will rush through uh, the emulation uh, for D-Shrift a bit because it's, it was not the, the problematic one. So as you've already seen, these are the floppies um, that the archive has and with help from uh, Dirk von Sochodelitz from the University of Freiburg, uh, Freiburg project that you already mentioned, uh, we could they extracted the data for us, and we had these things then as a couple of files on to, um, just in two folders. Um, then we had to find out uh, what was the original environment, so we checked these. Uh, these are the, uh, the readmes that were printed back then. So there's a little hint there, like the, the way you access the things. Um, you need an IBM PC. We also knew that the uh, Andreas Müller-Pohle, who was uh, the head behind Imatrix Publications, he had an old uh, uh, PC20 Commodore computer uh, that could still run D-Schrift. So it was clear that we needed um, to have a DOS environment. So we just chose DOSBox. <laughs> And there were only like two, two things that were really important. There was, there is some audio in the, in the program that is, it's, it's a few bits. Uh, it's not really essential to the whole textual representation, but we thought it shows a lot of what people were thinking and trying to do back then when programming these things. And we needed working the F keys, the function keys, because they were vital to the, um, navigation through the, uh, through the program and through the text. So we had to fiddle around a bit, like um, 
uh, uh, tried different versions of DOSBox and, and changed the config files, but it was fairly easy to find a working configuration. So what we had is an old AT keyboard that is uh, from that time frame. The D-Shift came out in 87. Um, and we chose a VGA monitor standard because it had just been around by the time um, and we thought that might be a good way to, to be accurate in terms of that uh, and also to use a standard that is still in use today as uh, this is VGA2. <laughs> so we thought we, uh, we are clever there. And then we just uh, had a Raspberry Pi running the dust box and we hooked up a PC speaker to it to have the sound be uh, the original thing, kind of. So this is uh, the little setup. It's quite dark. This is it again with the PC speaker. And this is uh, a picture of setting things up in ZKM when suddenly the only real problem we had with this project uh, came up. That was when I prepared the things. I used the uh, Raspberry Pi's uh, HDMI out and I had a converter to VGA and everything worked fine. When we hooked it up to uh, ZKM's um, newer uh, monitors, they didn't want to show anything. Um, so the v VGA was really not doing anything. We used uh, uh, old CRT monitors then and hoped like we use older monitors, they might be able to uh, display the low re uh, resolution VGA, but nothing worked. And even the uh, emulation wouldn't really start up. Um, because there was the wrong monitor connected. So we had to uh, switch to the composite out on the Raspberry Pi, and we were lucky to have this, uh, this Commodore, uh, the old Commodore monitor around. So after some fiddling and uh, switching the, the dust box from VGA to EGA output, we finally managed to get everything to work. So we just had a few security measures. We uh, uh, we turned off all the control alt delete stuff and um, had a loop that will automatically rerun the shrift and copy the fresh files so people can't destroy it and that uh, worked well for the execution in ZKM. Schreiben für publizieren, the thing you just uh, already explained, uh, is also called Flusser Hypertext Prototype 2. Um, which, uh, as you also have heard, is, uh, has been given on an old performer to the Flusser archive, and I got that picture up again because um, we knew that there were some things that would not run smoothly within the project as we had, we had it on that original machine. Um, this is, I took from a talk uh, from Claudia Becker, who was involved in the first exhibition uh, of that software at Transmediale, and what they did is they just wrote a bug report, kind of as a funny thing to, to deal with it and also to tell people that there is, a, it's a prototype, it has been Ben at the guy who, who supervised the project. He has also worked on that uh, software even after the uh, Kernforschungsinstitut had, had canceled the thing. He worked at home and then it, it progressed uh, to the Flusser archive and somewhere on the way this, uh, these errors have um, come up, uh, especially the unerwarteter Fehler, like unexpected error 5454, which caused everything to crash, really, and uh, we were using, we were planning on using emulations for things to run stable, and we thought that was not a good idea to show Flusser's um, philosophizing through this technology and in dialogue with the people using it. This like have the program crash in certain positions just doesn't do that and we would actually fall short of Flusser's uh, vision. So I did uh, another uh, bug report and I looked at it a bit more closely and I, um, I could uh, 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 narrow it down to this one file, Ton 8 below here, I have it here. This is, uh, Ton is just like sound. So these things store uh, the actual audio um, information in the uh, form of hypercard stack files. And every time you would um, reference a sound that is in tone 8, which means um, 
That is, I just I calculated uh, if, they, if they would be spread evenly, then two and eight would be somewhere around here, and that turned out to be true. Uh, the, the hypertext works in a way that if you switch it on, it would just read the, the uh, Vortrag, the, the lecture to you in Flusser's own voice, and it would switch to the next card when Flusser reaches uh, the, the appropriate, you know, the, the thing, <laughs> the point. And then, yeah, once you run into Ton 8, it would just crash. So how to fix Ton 8, that was uh, my, uh, the thing that I had to do then. And I didn't know how, because we had another problem. The hypercard stacks that we had there were closed. They were, uh, uh, the user level was set to the lowest one, so we couldn't access any scripts, we couldn't see any, anything inside of those stacks. And we didn't want to uh, work on the old Mac, uh, of course. We didn't want to kill like, the only machine that we still have that's uh, holding that thing, so we, I, like, I tried to, to copy it to many different systems to find one that works where I can experiment with it. And I happen to have an old Performa 630 of my own. So that was uh, very helpful. <laughs> it was my first computer. Um, and an old iMac. Uh, and we have these uh, uh, Basilix 2 uh, emulations, the other ones I couldn't get to, couldn't get to work. But on none of these systems that I copied the Flusser Hypertext to would it play any audio. It was just everything worked, everything behaved just like I've uh, written it down in the, in, the, in the extensive bug report, but audio would just not play. So I needed to do two things. I needed to access the HyperCard stack in order to hopefully fix Tone 8, and I needed to find a way to have audio playback on these machines, and then this is where uh, we got some help from Adam Rosen from the Vintage Mac Museum in Boston, who uh, helped us out with showing us how to like hack yourself to, to get user level five and access uh, the stack's internal things. And he also provided us with copies that he extracted from those hypercard stack tone audio files, so we could then maybe hopefully recreate the broken one. So here's just the hack. I want to go through it really quick because uh, very quickly I, I, I liked it a lot. So you had to not open up the Flusser uh, stack directly, but you had to open HyperCard first. You come to the home stack. Some people around here might still remember. Um, then you had to open the Flusser stack. Then you had to navigate to the card that you wanted to actually access. Then you had to switch back to the home stack, open the preferences, and there you could switch it back to scripting, and then you could access the stack info where there's the button with a script, and then finally you were there, which was uh, a relief for us. So we found that on those emulations, uh, other hypercard applications could indeed play back sound, but only the Flusser hypertext couldn't. So what I did is I thought I had to find the the point in the scripts where the actual command is, like where the actual audio handling happens. And I had to go through all of these uh, functions and had to get used to the funny way they named them. Um, and I found some, uh, some function calls that I did not find in the hypertext documentation, uh, hypercard documentation, and I did not find them as custom functions that the programmers back then put in there. So they were just called, but I did not know like, where they were actually um, stored with it, those information uh, where these functions would be. So that was a bit, uh, that was weird and also um, verdächtig. Um, and I came, uh, the, the, the functions in question were these f sound and f play and uh, it said here in Flusser stack ENST, which I never knew what this is. We, we did not uh, have contact with the original programmers. Bent Wingert couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, help us because he was not programming the things. So I researched these things and uh, I found that X command, X function, and driver are ways that HyperCard um, provides to actually plug in code snippets from uh, from other, uh, uh, like in other programming languages, like I think even assembler, but I'm not sure about that. 
Um, so you're not using AppleScript there, but you're using external code. Um, and that these would be stored in the resource fork of these uh, of the of the hypercard stacks themselves. So I used the trusty old res edit that I uh, had used when I had this uh, my first Mac. I remembered that, and voila, I found these things there, um, and they were named in exactly they were those functions that I was looking for. But when you open them, you get this, and this is where my uh, my, my knowledge definitely ended, so this was a dead end. But uh, knowing that this is external code in some other programming language, like native code probably, I figured that might be the, the reason why this Flusser hypertext only runs on that particular machine on which they had probably written it. And it was never published, so they never had to go through the process of making that universally uh, runnable. So this is unknown code. We don't know what it does. We suspect it to not work. So what we did is we got uh, a copy of HyperCard software, one that features like 2.3, one that features the add motion to add-on, because that uh, enabled HyperCard to actually do some more crazy um, multimedia stuff, which included audio playback. So we set out to just go in there and change the actual thing um, to use the methods of uh, add motion to, and we canceled out the F sound, the, the custom sound driver things that the programmers did back then. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also had to change some of the things as a result of that because we used this, put the sound into status, which would then uh, play the audio in the emulation, but it was slower. So what I looked further into the code and I found that there were some functions that they wrote, uh, lookup stack and wo weiter, like where to, where to go from here, there to go from here. And these functions turned out to always return the same uh, values no matter what you put in them. So I figured I could add, uh, as well just leave them out and comment them out to gain a bit more speed because they were also really slow. And we did that and that is the way that we actually managed to get the hypertext to work again on the emulated system and as a side product, oh, no, now I've sped up, but I can show the actual thing then. Uh, as a side product um, of looking into the resource forks, uh, using rest edit and um, using add motion, so I was now in charge of what the hypertext does audio-wise, and I could recreate the Ton8 file um, by extracting the resources from the original one and set up a new, uh, a new stack. Uh, I wrote my own function to handle the, uh, uh, the, the different tone stacks and I put the new one in there, referenced it. Um, we already had like a newly digitized version of the Vortrag, of the, uh, of the lecture ready at the Flusser archive in case we would have to somehow get that into the old Apple sound resource format, but luckily, it turned out that the failure, uh, the unexpected error 5454 that we ran into um, would, be, would, would be caused by probably some bit that flipped in the part of the Ton8 file that was not dealing with the resources but with some hypercard stuff. So we could take the resources, put a new one together, and the thing worked. And this is an image of the thing in the installation. So now I wanted to just quickly prove <laughs> that it really works. Do we have audio? Do we have the computer audio? By showing you the actual Basilisk 2 emulation. Aye! This is how it always goes, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. How else could this uh, talk end? <laughs> but I can show you something else. I can show you a little video of Die Schrift, which I forgot to show you earlier. Because there you see the funny way they made use of the audio. 
And that was almost all the audio in the whole program. <laughs> if this crashes, I just end this. But usually. Okay. Wow. Ah! There we go. This, you have, to, you have to take a look at this, because you could go and take a cost pool, but like a, a little sample from the actual text, and once you have gone through like three or five of those samples, uh, this would happen. Hmm? Nothing would happen. I didn't want to use my computer because it's... I'll just let this thing here, and you can proceed with the... Uh, uh, the rest of uh, today while, ah, there it is, while the bookworm eats up all the, um, all the letters from Flusser's text. And this is all the audio in the whole program. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe and Barouf, for this very detailed uh, explanation of what you did.